Hey guys, Perry here, back New York Comic Con. I've got another exclusive Collider video interview for you right now. We are talking about the movie Wheelman with Frank Grillo and Jeremy Rush. Guys, thank you so much for coming today. Huge congratulations on this. Thank you. Especially because it marks a lot of firsts for you guys. You producing yeah. and your first uh, endeavor as a director for a feature film. That is, it's something else. It is something else. Yeah, I'm over the moon. It's been a great experience. Can you tell me a little bit about coming to the decision, okay, I'm ready to direct my first movie now? Because it's one thing to say, oh, I have an idea and I want to make it happen. It's another to actually hit the point where you really can make it happen. Yeah, that's totally true. It was a culmination of a lot of things. I mean, it was it was screenwriting for the last um, on spec for the last 13 years with the aspiration to direct and finish this script. And uh, it, it got some interest around town, but no one wanted to even discuss me directing. And so I contacted Joe Carnahan, who was kind of a peripheral friend, and he said, you have, you have to direct this. And I'm gonna make it easy for you. You can't sell it, you have to direct it, I'm gonna produce it. And, uh, and then we started talking about casting, and he said, what do you think about Frank Grillo? I said, you know exactly what I think about Frank Grillo. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Joe Joe called me and said, I'm sending you a script, I want you to read it, let me know what you think. And I read it, and I was like, who's this guy? This is, this is great, this is so unique. And, and uh, we sat down and talked at the Viceroy Hotel in Santa Monica, yeah, California. Right. And I think brought it to CAA a week later, and they were in Cannes with it a week after that, and it was sold that week, and we were making a movie two months later. It's crazy. Yeah. And how about the producing gig on this? What, what made you think, I want to take on that work on top of all the other work you had to do for well, just being in the role? Yeah, Joe and I, who did The Grey together, and we, were, we had become very close, uh, were looking to become a company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, this could be a great opportunity. Uh, we got CAA surrounding us, and, and uh, we were confident that Jeremy could execute it. And, uh, and yeah, we were boots on the ground producers, uh, and it was a great experience, and it, and it really was the launching pad for our company, War Party. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything about producing that surprised you? Because, you know, I, I went to film school, I made shorts in school, but until you get out there and you produce a feature, there were so many things that I just didn't realize were my responsibility, like going away. and. S silly things like making sure there was food and toilet paper in the house was right. there anything that just shocked you that you had to take care of it all kind of shocked me and you know it's it's a, it's a tough job you know it's 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 hard to nail down what exactly a producer is but a producer is everything and you have to deal with a lot of problems it's pushing a rock up a hill every day trying to find more time and more money um, but I loved it I love the challenge. I think Joe and I worked well together along with Jeremy, and uh, we've since produced another film up in Calgary. We just finished producing a TV series for Netflix. Uh, so now it's, it's now that's what we're doing. That's yeah. awesome. And you two worked on that stuff together also? Joe and I? You and Joe? Yeah, we have our company, that's War great. Party. We do every, now we do everything together. We're making The Raid, uh, which is a remake oh, yeah, of yeah. the original, and uh, we're doing a movie called Boss Level that he wrote. Uh, another movie called Point Blank. We have a great slate of mm -hmm. very similar sub $20 million action genre films. Mm -hmm. yeah. So speaking of budget, you had to do quite a bit with that car in this one and there's a lot of uh, uh, special effects makeup too. Is there anything in particular that was especially challenging, whether it's getting the driving shots or, the, I mean, there's, there's one death in this movie that I do not want to spoil at all, but it looked really great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a technical endeavor. This is making a, mm -hmm. a, a driving film of this nature is a logistical, technical nightmare, to be honest. So every day we were we were problem solving, and um, you know, you, you surround yourself with really talented, really experienced people, and um, and you solve the problems together. That's how you get it done. So the large majority of the movie is Frank with a car so what exactly is the set situation are you guys on location are you shooting a lot of it on a stage we shot practically so all the stunts are practical yeah. um like 90 percent of the driving is practical we, we shot a little bit of stage stuff just for the sake of saving some time mm -hmm. um but it's very hard to pick out and it's mostly dialogue stuff so a lot of practical driving boston was really accommodating in allowing us to um to for instance shut down like a, a quarter mile loop and drive our our stunt chase sequences non-stop and at speed 
So we weren't driving at 25 miles an hour and trying to make it look fast. We were driving fast. Like maniacs. Frank was yeah. driving fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was great. You had to train for stuff like that, I imagine. A little bit, but uh, you know, I know how to drive. <laughs> just wing I, it. It's just going fast. <laughs> What about the car itself? Are you guys just using a real car or is it modified at all so you can get certain shots? Both, yeah. Frank yeah. is driving a real vehicle, uh, the BMW and, and a Porsche. And, um, and then we have stunt vehicles. One is called a pod mm -hmm. and it's an actual car with a, a driver's pod on top. So the stuntman drives on the roof so that the, the acting and the, the performance can happen inside the car. Um, and then we had uh, the Biscuit, which is like a flatbed race car. That was super cool. That was cool. And you put like a, a, what they call a buck. It's like a badass basically. idea. And then it's called the Biscuit. The biscuit. Right? It's fantastic. Because it was used on Sea Biscuit. We call it the Biscuit. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. They invented it for, for Sea Biscuit. biscuit. Yeah. yeah. To put the horses on top. Mm. Um, so we had various different rigs. Oh. That's, I mean, the stuff looks really intense. And then yeah. I'm going to transition from that to the least intense stuff that nobody really thinks about. And it's insert shots when, especially with a driving film, when you're worrying about having to show shifting gears and everything. I feel like nobody thinks of that, but it's so important to increase pace and tension. And I'll tell you something, when you read the script and, uh, you know, thinking you know everything about making movies and acting, you know, Joe and I were like, no, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. And, and to Jeremy's credit, it, that was all of, of his vision and all of that stuff makes the movie what it is without it it's 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 not it's it's flatter mm -hmm. so that was something that he knew that we needed to have in there and uh, and uh, you know the, listen to the first time film director the job is to build credibility for the performance right the right. performance is the most direct conduit of the story to the audience and so all the technical stuff, the inserts, the, the costumes, the, the wardrobe rather, the, the, the different camera angles, the lighting, it's all to build credibility around the performance. And um, you're the first person to ask, actually, out of all of our, the interviews yeah. I've done, nobody else has mentioned the inserts. And My they are critical. My background is horror. And, you know, sometimes people just want to move on and get the money shot. Like, right. no, you need to get a shot of the door creaking open, someone's right. hand reaching for the knob. It's, it's build, really important. To build, to build, to build. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your work in this? Because you do spend the large majority of the movie yelling at a cell phone. Yes. So yeah. what are you working with while you're on set? You know, it's interesting because when I when I kind of was excited about the opportunity, I knew I had a lot of work to do before I got to set, a lot of homework to do. Because I could, it would either be really cool or an epic failure. And uh, so, you know, my, my job was to know where I was psychologically, spiritually, physically, emotionally at every given moment of the movie. And so it was it was coming prepared every day and understanding where I was. And uh, it, it was a it was a testament to hard work. That's what it was, not talent to just really working on. Give yeah. yourself a little more credit because my next question is going to be, is there a lot of improvising on this? Because there's certain things where, you know, you hear an answer on the phone. It's not what you want. And your reaction feels like it feels like you've heard it for the first time. It wasn't. It was, Jeremy wrote an amazing piece of material. And so, I mean, there's, there's a couple of places where maybe you get more of the essence of, of, you know, just to make it a little bit more authentic. But we stuck to the script and we worked on the script. Every night, you know, if something wasn't working, we, you know, we worked on the script together, him, Joe, and I. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing was, when I was on the phone when we were doing it, it wasn't with the actor. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it was with a bad reader who was reading rote or just trying too hard. So that was the biggest challenge for me, was to not fall into any bad rhythm because there was nobody on the other end mm -hmm. that was helping me out. That's so yeah. true. You totally pick up on what somebody else is exactly doing. So right. I can yeah. see that being a potential trap to fall yeah. into. Uh, silly question. How did you pick the ringtone for that phone? Because it's something you do hear a lot and we all know the go-to Apple ringtone. That's a great question. So yeah. it's a hard decision to you make. You have done this before. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. The first ringtone was grading. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was too much. We, we went through, I don't even know, maybe a dozen different ringtones. Yeah. And um, That's great. we lived with one for a while, temp, um, but we couldn't get the clearance for it. We lived with the actual ringtone. And so then we had some custom ringtones uh, composed. And um, that was the one that was, like Frank said, it was the least grading. grading. Yeah. yeah. That's the way to go when you hear it yeah. so many. You know what else I heard a lot in this movie? F-bombs. Yeah. How did really? you count? Do you know how many oh, there we are? Know. We, yes, we, we, we do. Every time we show the film, Jeremy likes to do a little contest. And whoever asks a question has to uh, preface it with how many F-bombs. Usually he gives away something from the movie. 
And I think there was 186. What was it? Do you want me to give the number? Give the number. It was 254. Wow. 254. I was trying to do the math based on how many minutes the movie is and right. then how many right. times, how frequently I yeah. know that word was said. Yeah. All right. It's second, it's second only to one other movie in the history of cinema. Right? Tell her what that movie is. What's that is. one? Well, there's there's a couple of, of like F word documentaries. Right. So if you take those off the list, I think we were, for a thriller, we're number two. And, and out of films, all time films, I think we were ninth or something. Yeah. I'll take it. We're in the top 10. <laughs> that, it's kind of a, a yeah. cool claim to I like, fame. Yeah, <laughs> I like to be in, in, the, in the record books. Uh, can you guys tell me a little now about working with Netflix on this? Because obviously Netflix is on the rise in so many different respects in film right now. And they're letting movies happen that might not ever get made if we're just talking about theatrical releases. So what was your experience like collaborating with them? Uh, uh, amazing. It really was. They they were g g real collaborators and supportive. They left us alone most of the time. We didn't we didn't we didn't hear anything from them. But but afterwards, when the film was made and they and they saw it and they loved it, they've been great with us with their marketing department, with every aspect of the post production process as far as getting the film out there. They have been incredible partners. We I have also a TV show with them, uh, and I, I can't say enough good things. You know, they've been disruptors of the business. In a good way, in the best of in the best of uh, use of the word, and they uh, they are forced to be reckoned with, mm -hmm. and they've changed the business in the best in the best possible way. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. And how about just from a creator standpoint? Because you know, most people I know we actually hosted a screening on the big screen with Steve recently, and it's a great movie to be able to see on the big screen. But most people are going to see what you made on their computer or on their TV. Right. Was there anything in mind while you were making it for that format specifically? No, we we wanted to create a cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. And so we shot it as though it was a movie um, with lens selections and our, our framing and uh, et cetera, all the technical sound execution, design, sound every, design. Everything. Kevin O'Connell, who won the Oscar for Hacksaw Ridge this year, was our sound designer. And uh, we shot with anamorphic lenses, which are beautifully cinematic. Yeah. And yeah, and we did that for all under six million bucks in 17 days. That's so. something else. When you're talking about a driving film, especially right. one with this much action, and I mean, my horror brain focuses on, you know, right. like blood and continuity yeah. and all that. It just seems like it was a production that needed to be managed properly on so many different levels. Yeah. yeah. But this was a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for Thank coming you. by the suite Thank today. you very much. Uh, are you going to walk the floor at Comic-Con? Do you have your no. eye on anything while you're here? No. no I, yeah, you know. He's you know. not. I am. I'm going to hit it. <laughs> You should. He knows yeah. well what these experiences are like. It's crowded. It's a lot of fun down there, yeah. but it's not easy to get around. No, so it's not. enjoy celebrating <laughs> your movie. You. Huge congratulations Thank you again. So much. Guys, so much. Wheelman on Netflix, October 20th. Check it out. We're going to be back real soon with more Collider video coverage of New York Comic Con 2017.